Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of the Sports Insight with your host Alamdar Khan. And as, as you know, we talk about sports from all across the globe. But not to forget, you can surely reach out to us on our social media handle, which is at the rate of in this new sports that basically work for Twitter and Instagram. But anyways, we'll go to the headlines first. Right, India thrashed England by 66 runs in the first ODI on Tuesday. And yes, New Zealand defeated Bangladesh by five wickets to take an unapplausible 2-0 lead in the three-match ODI series. And yes, from the world of football, Champions League, Real Madrid to host Liverpool in Spain after the COVID policy change. And yes, from the world of NBA, Brooklyn Nets beat Portland Trailblazers 116-112. And yes, from the world of Formula One, Mick Schumacher, son of Michael Schumacher, to start his career this weekend in Bahrain as a rookie. And yes, those were the headlines. And yes, we start with with regards to cricket. Yes, England versus India. It has been a crucial season, not only for uh, England itself, but obviously the last victory, the last, the first ODI, uh, India managed to grab that victory, and they managed to win it by 66 runs. We have with us Seth Burnett. Uh, Seth, thank you for being a part of the show, and we'd love to have more, more and more overview with regards to England versus India from your end. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So, how do you see this entire tour? It's it's slightly coming to a point or a situation in which India is definitely do on on the dominating side. Not to forget that England is a solid uh, team with regards to bat batting side and obviously the bowling side. But slowly and gradually, things are switching from uh, you know if you talk about the tests, it went up away to India and then then came to the T20s and now the ODIs. What's your take on this? Yeah, I think it's been a very challenging tour for England, hasn't it? With the fact that they came in on the back of their time in Sri Lanka, where they played very, very well, actually. In the two tests that were there, there was some hope that they were going to be able to follow that up with a good performance. And they started so well with that comprehensive victory in the first test match. And things really went to pop from there. England shuffling the pack. They were trying to rotate the squad to keep the players fresh, those that had been away. Uh, for a long period of time in, in various different stages of isolation and, and in biosecure bubbles. And it's really seen the tour degenerate. There was a, a boost at the start of the T20 series where, where they won that game. Um, but the, the start of this ODI series, you know, England looked like they were all on for victory. They looked very, very comfortable and confident. Johnny Bairstow with a, a wonderful 90-odd. Um, but then they threw it all away. Their batting absolutely collapsed. And... They look a little bit like a tired team right now. And that will be concerning to England, particularly with the number one rank in, in the world rankings available. Should India win that series through nothing, then they would climb to the top. And that would be a, a bit of a blow for the current world champions and uh, Owen Morgan's side who really hold that very dear, that opportunity to be, to be number one in the world is something that's important. Right. If we, if we look at the... ODI side or the T20 side, obviously they're topping the charts, number one, England is still on top. But yes, it would definitely be a big blow with regards to them. But then as you mentioned, the biosecure bubble situation, the isolation situation, it surely brings out a very uh, mentally hardening situation for the players. I think it's really, really difficult. And when you hear what the players who are in and out of those bubbles are saying, particularly with the IPL coming hot on the heels of this series. So, you know, if you're a player like Moeen Ali, for example, who was away in Sri Lanka with the play, he then came to India, didn't play the first test, but did play the second test. He was home for just seven days right. by the time he finished quarantining and what have you. Then he was back on a plane to be there for the start of the T20 series. He didn't play. Uh, in those games, but he did come into the ODI squad for, uh, and the ODI team for, the, for this first match. So the task is huge. And, and what you've got to remember is that there's not been even any respite when they come home because you go into quarantine, right. you then go home, but the whole country has been locked down. And sure. it means nothing's open there. You have supermarkets that are open, but you can't do much more than walk the dog 
and see your immediate family. You can't even go out and see your extended family or go have a barbecue or, or go and spend time at other people's houses. That's just not possible. And so I think that's the one thing that we've got to really recognize is that the, the mental health of these players has been massively impacted by these extended stays in bubbles and the fact that they don't get any time off really, even when they come home. Absolutely. With regards to the mental health perspective, I still remember the last season, um, the last tour of the Proteus to Pakistan and how De Kock actually came up to a collapse and obviously being a captain of the team came up to a collapse and that collapse eventually collapsed the entire performance of the team. And then when he went back to South Africa, he just said that, you know, we ha I have to take a mental break and that's what their board said. It's really affecting them. Yeah, it, well, it, it is. And again, when you hear from them, I, I listened to Jimmy Anderson speaking about, the rock, about this stuff. And one of the things that he says is, is just so hard to get away from the cricket. Right. And that means that if things aren't going well, then it stays with you. Not just for the time when you're at the ground where, you know, in the good old days, you would have gone out for a nice meal with your mates and you may have gone and found a bar somewhere and enjoyed that experience of being in whatever culture you were in. Whereas now actually it's, it's different, you know, in between test matches, you're just sitting and stewing on the fact that there's a terrific collapse in the, in, in the last match. I mean, it's sitting there with you. You know, if you've got, like Johnny Bersel in the test, he, he struggled to get any runs at all. He got a couple of ducks and, and he, he wasn't able to kind of free himself in the way that he would have wanted to. And it would have just gnawed away at him. Uh, fortunately for him, he's, he's coming to the, you know, the T20 and then the ODI stuff, and he's been able to free the shackles a little bit, and that will have been a weight off his shoulder. So, this is a big thing for cricket, and they, they've got to kind of figure it out. And the other thing you've got to remember right. is that the majority of these cricketers don't have any vaccines. Right. They've not been vaccinated at all because they don't fall into the categories, particularly in the UK. Right. Um, where you would be vaccinated. So they don't have that sort of first line or second line of defense. They're still going out there and, and having to manage uh, the possibility of contracting COVID and the implications it could have, not just for them, but for those people around. Absolutely. Talking about complications with regards to the COVID scene, we talk, if we talk, let's talk about Olympics. Oh, you've covered Olympics as well five times. I just have an idea the amount of delays that has been put to the Olympics, obviously with regards to the COVID-19 situation, how do you think they will still be able to pull off the, this huge prestigious event? Well, it's going to be a massive ask, isn't it? I'm going to be commentating on the hockey house in, in Tokyo. And you do wonder, I mean, in Rio, the stadium was loud, there were loads of people there, uh, and it was a great atmosphere event. And it feels like it's going to be a lot more sterile in Tokyo because it's going to have to be, you know, everybody's going to be wearing masks everywhere they go. Um, you're not really going to be allowed to go too many other places than, than your bedroom of wherever you're staying and then the stadiums you're going to be reporting at and then back again. And I think it's going to be very much like a biosecure bubble over two venues from the stadium and your accommodation. And that's how it's going to be. And for the athletes, of course, it, it, it's it's going to be similar. I mean, imagine if all of your life, you know, the sweet spot of your career is going to be getting to Tokyo. Right. And this was your chance to win a medal. Yet you're going to potentially be doing it in empty or half empty stadiums. And, you know, the one thing you would say is Japan has a pretty good handle on COVID at the moment. Uh, it doesn't seem to be massively rife within the society. The other thing we know is this, this Olympics has to go ahead because of the TV and corporate deals that are in place for the IOC to continue to function well. So these these are all big things. But I think if you take it on a personal level, and I spend a lot of time speaking to athletes, right. people who plan 2020 as their final year of competition, now they've had to kind of string it out into 2021. And what we're talking about here are people who are thinking about potentially having families potentially moving on to the second half of their working life. Right. And they've had to delay all of that and then find a way, having trained all up for 2020, can they find that motivation and energy to go again? And there's going to be an awful lot of people, I think, between the months of you know, March and, and probably the start of July, 
who decide that may, maybe they don't want to go and not do themselves justice. Seth, let's maybe hope. Draw from your Seth, let's hope that you know all of the situation comes to an end. Uh, it's it's been a tricky journey for us all, and I would like to thank you for being a part of the show and discussing the updates, not only with regards to cricket but obviously with regards to the coronavirus thing. Thank you very much, sir. So yes, Thanks, that was an interesting date with regards to uh, the COVID-19 situation. I'll give a quick news with regards to New Zealand versus Bangladesh. Yes, New Zealand actually managed to defeat Bangladesh by five wickets on Tuesday. And New Zealand is, is leading the series by 2-0. It's going to be an interesting take. There's one more match left, but I don't know if the devastation continues for Bangladesh. Anyways, this was the major updates with regards to uh, cricket. We'll take a quick break. And once we take the quick break, we'll be back and discuss more sports. See you guys after the break. Welcome back. Yes, this was the break and before the break we did discuss a lot of cricket but obviously when it comes to our show we added more and more stuff in regards to sports. But anyways, we'll talk about football here. But to discuss football we have our correspondent, a global sports correspondent for the Associated Press, Rob Harris with us. Rob, welcome to the show. Good to join you. Great. Uh, we'll talk more about, we'll start with the first story that we've just been discussing and we thought that, you know, we definitely want your input. Real Madrid to host Liverpool in Spain after COVID change policy. And not only that, the policy will end on the March 30th with them facing on the 6th of April. So COVID situation has definitely created a lot of chaotic situations for everyone out there. You being in... in yes, yeah, been... A yes, I'd, I'd want your take on that. Yeah, I mean, it's been ever-changing, really, and it's caused real disruption to things like the Champions League in terms of Hungary, Budapest becoming the home ground for Liverpool at times and for so many other clubs because of these travel restrictions. What, what, what it's been is often concerns, particularly about the variant of coronavirus that was discovered in Britain towards the end of last year, the fact it was uh, potentially more um, contagious. So, you know, countries wanted to cut off links and to Britain and reduce any potential uh, risk of transmission and yes now Spain had banned flights from Britain but it is easing that ban now towards the end of the month. Britain's in a very different place compared with the rest of Europe now where it might be this so-called British variant that is so prevalent across Europe right. actually and Europe is said to be in a third wave of the coronavirus pandemic. Britain is actually seeing case numbers and deaths considerably drop because almost 30 million of the the population have had at least one dose of a vaccine so far so in terms of britain the situation is going down and uh, the longer term hope as well as for things like champions league games being played in their um, venues as planned of course is for the european championship the, the, the crucial thing is well this game will be played in madrid now this champions league game for manchester city there won't be any fans in the stadium so we're merely talking about the location of where to play a game in an empty stadium here rather than um you know the, the venue mattering in terms of the ability of fans to travel and of course it's not like the players will be able to go out and about in Madrid either they'll have to stay within the the hotel too so uh, it almost could be anywhere and of course being being uh, being Real Madrid, uh, being um, you know being Real Madrid for Liverpool as well they're not even playing in the uh, in the Bernabeu because uh, that's currently being rebuilt they're playing at the training ground so right. actually yes. although Liverpool can go to Madrid to play yeah. the Champions League game they're doing it to play at the training ground. Right. It's uh, one thing that's common these days, if you note, the empty stadium syndrome. How are the players uh, helping themselves to cope with that? Because the enthusiasm is definitely because of the, of the cheering, the people out there, the supporters out there. How does it, it, it how is it impact acting, uh, you know, all the players? Well, it creates a different dynamic in the stadium because, for one, the players can't all sit together on the bench, so they have to spread out further back into the stand. And very often at stadiums, that means sitting very close to us because we as media are spread out as well. Right. So at Manchester City, for instance, Cal Walker is on the bench quite a bit, often is uh, so far back, he's very close to the media and he's sort of quite engaging in banter and he's sort of shouting stuff during the game and sort of engaging in it, turning around to us. Uh, you know, when you're at uh, Chelsea, the players, the substitutes are just a few metres often um, to my um, to my right in one seat I've been in. And, uh, you know, you're hearing everything going on. You're seeing some of the tedium there. Um, you see even in a warm up when they're, um, you know, w w when they're subs, the fact they will be chatting around with their opponents and even talking to, to photographers. And obviously you hear a lot that's going on on the pitch itself. You hear a lot of the 
the, the normal uh, um, abuse, you know, safe abuse, if you could call it that. The right. sort of just the, some of the swearing and the frustrations that that often are, are prevalent in games. And so you can hear a lot of that. But ultimately, the stadiums can be pretty soulless. You know, when I was at uh, Chelsea for the Atletico Madrid Champions League, uh, last 16, second leg, um, just last week, it, 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 it's something that should be a big occasion. And of course, the emptiness, the silence is uh, really striking, particularly when it's just a few minutes before kickoff. True. And um, if you were to cough, it'd be heard all around the stadium. Right. It would definitely be a haunting experience, I'm sure. But I hope that you know this COVID-19 situation comes to an end. Anyways, we'll talk about the Tottenham Hotspurs victory against Aston Villa 2-0. What's your take on that? And then we can further go ahead and probably discuss the standings. Yeah, man, what an important win that was for Jason Mourinho coming off the back of a really bad week. I mean, the North London derby defeat to Arsenal was one thing where, you know, there wasn't much of a fight until they were down to 10 men. But then the complete collapse at Dynamo Zagreb was, uh, you know, pretty humiliating for Spurs, really. The fact that they had been 2-0 up from the first leg, the fact that they had been, um, you know, pretty safe in a dire first half, but then completely collapsing and then losing in uh, injury time as well and uh, so losing in extra time. And then we heard the uh, the criticisms of the captain, Hugo Lloris, as well, questioning things about the team. Um, then going to Aston Villa on Sunday and, uh, you know, producing a win that was necessary to stay in touch with the top four. The fact they're only uh, about three points, I think, from Chelsea in fourth place gives that hope that they can make the Champions League because although they have the League Cup final against Manchester City right. next month, that could produce a first trophy since 2008 for Tottenham. Really, it's about getting in the Champions League and back again there and getting the, the revenue, particularly was they're still paying off the cost of this vast billion dollar plus stadium. But um, the win was so important for, uh, for, for Mourinho and the fact that um, you know, it, it seems that Ben Davis even might have been playing recently with an injury. He was forced to pl pull out of the Wales squad. Harry Kane, you know, he's now on England duty. There's three games he could potentially play in and Mourinho will be absolutely fearful if he does play a significant amount of all three of those. So it's a real anxious time now, like for so many managers as uh, his, you know, the players are out on international duty. True. I think it's, it's the complete struggle now, as you said, that, you know, everybody's basically looking forward for being in the top four, to be honest. And I think this victory would surely add in more value to them. And if you, if you look at the table right now, Manchester City definitely is is out there and dominating no matter what. Manchester United obviously making a comeback, but obviously he, they'll not be able to come to the point of you know grabbing the first position. But it's all about the, it's basically all about the top four. What's your take on your choice, or you think would be the top four by the end of the season? Well, well, Manchester City. It's amazing they're running away with it so significantly because they had to really fight back into that position. Of course, Tottenham were top up in December, Manchester United then were top um, early in January, and now City have stormed through 14 points ahead, which uh, really uh, owes as much to the shortcomings of the likes of Manchester United. Uh, and United, of course, going out of the FA Cup at Leicester as well, a big blow to Solskjaer, because however pleased United are with some of the steadiness of Solskjaer, the fact he has got them into second place, so Champions League qualification does look likely he's still not won a trophy yet and you know we've almost got used to this at Manchester United now the the, the lack of success in the post Alex Ferguson era since 2013 True. but for a club like Manchester United to have not won a trophy since 2017 since uh, Jose Mourinho won the uh, Europa League four years it's just you know it's incredible given what we got used to for so long under Alex Ferguson uh, then you go place down to Leicester well they, of course, collapsed on, in the final weeks of the season. They looked nailed on for uh, for a Champions League spot a year ago when football went into shutdown for 100 day, days in the Premier League. And then it was on the final day of the season when I was at the King Power Stadium where Leicester threw away top four on the final day to Manchester United. Surely they can't uh, do so again. The fact they've got um, Inacho there scoring, um, you know, in a good run of form, scored uh, in the FA Cup as well. I think it's... Not nine goals in nine games or something for him at the moment, or and um, so it's probably fourth place up for grabs. And Thomas Tuchel, 14 games unbeaten so far since replacing Frank Lampard. That's, that that's been... one magic. That's one magic that actually happened for Chelsea. I wish that this had actually happened way before. Chelsea would have been on a very different position by now. 
Yeah, it's interesting to imagine what would happen if the change had taken place earlier. Was Lampard ever the right appointment in the first place? And uh, we actually heard some very rare words from Roman Abramovich, the Chelsea owner, in the last week, where he actually talked about, in an interview with Forbes, his policy of changing managers a lot and firing them. And he basically said it produces success ultimately. And, you know, there's no room for sentimentality. He is willing to discard even a club legend. And it's showing he gets it right, really. Where uh, You could look at Manchester United, where we've thought for so many points over the last couple of years, would Solskjaer survive? Would, would they look for a replacement? And perhaps their, their lack of conviction in terms of a decisive move in, in, in perhaps making a break might have been costly or ultimately in the long term, they get their rewards with Solskjaer. And of course, it's a predicament uh, that Tottenham are in. Uh, do they decide to stick with Jose Mourinho after this season? Do they, uh, you know, do, do they look to him to be able to deliver long-term success because it's been so fraught and frictious, obviously, with his players at times? And uh, you know, probably one of the managers in the uh, in the top, who's obviously endeared himself to so many, is uh, Brendan Rodgers at Leicester. Uh, then, of course, it's amazing we sort of not even mentioned Liverpool. We're almost sort of writing them out of the Champions League. That's place, one of that's one of the major upsets that I personally defense. saw as well. Yeah, with Liverpool, that's like one of the major upsets that we've been discussing lately. Wonder what's going through them, and obviously for those who support Liverpool as well. Yeah, the fact we've almost got used to them losing when for so long they were such an invincible force, particularly at Anfield, and now they're demise has almost been customary but uh, it's going to be very hard to get back into the top four but certainly it would be a huge success though for them this season if they do do manage to win the European Cup for the seventh time and that would completely effectively mask over all the uh, shortcomings in the Premier League perhaps particularly given all the injury problems that they still have with Jordan Henderson no sign of when he's going to return yet but Virgil van Dijk out for the season as well it's been so costly and um, then of course Arsenal, even though, of course, they, they did win the um, the North London derby. They uh, did well, actually, at West Ham, of course, on Sunday to come back from three goals down to draw three all, completed right. by the Lacazette um, um, header. And, um, you know, for them, it's probably just about trying to get into the Europa League places. But, of course, they are still in the Europa League, unlike Tottenham, who've gone out. So uh, they still, of course, do have the chance of winning it and then making the, uh, the Champions League that way, which would produce a trophy for, for Mikel Arteta, just as he did at Wembley in the FA Cup last last year. Right. Well, Rob, thank you so much for your great input uh, on the entire perspective of the English Premier League. If we had more time, I would have asked more questions, but we'll surely have you on the show again for sure. Thank you very much for being a part of the show. Sure, great to join you and keep well. Pleasure. Anyway, so that was the major updates with regards to the entire perspective of uh, the English Premier League. And yes, it's, it's still tricky. It's still tricky. But Manchester City is definitely leading with 71 points. Manchester United on the second, Leicester City on the third and Chelsea on the fourth. But let's see how things develop in the future for the top four. But anyways, we'll switch over to the next news, which is from the world of NBA. <clears throat> yes, so with, with regards to the NBA, not to forget that Brooklyn Nets win against the trial Blazers 116 to 112 on Wednesday. James Harden actually scored 25 points with 17 assists. And not to forget that Brooklyn then won 16 of their last 18 matches this season. Not to forget another thing that, you know, there was a lot of injuries in, in between of the team members, but uh, sometimes the trio didn't work like a trio because of a few injuries that actually uh, Kyrie Irving actually went through. But anyways, things are kind of shaping up for the Brooklyn Nets. But yes, the struggle is still on to be on the top of the charts. So that was from the world of NBA. I'll uh, quickly switch over to the world of Formula One. Yes, we talk about Mike Schumacher. Mike Schumacher is Michael Schumacher's son who is going to start his Formula One career very soon in Bahrain as a rookie. Yes, not always. We do remember the legend Mike Schuma Michael Schumacher himself uh, unfortunately had this accident uh, in, you know, while skiing. And, you know, since then he has been in, in a state of coma, which is definitely devastating for all people out there. But let's hope his son continues the legacy and we still hope that, you know, sometime in the future, maybe Michael Schumacher manages to get out of coma because he still is going through a lot of treatment and a lot of therapies. But he's always been a legend and he still is a living legend. We hope for the best and we also hope for the best for his son because Mick Schumacher actually has to go out there, perform for the respects of his father and he has to continue the same legacy which his father did. And not to forget that, you know, he's debuting on the same age as Michael Schumacher did. 
So that may be uh, that may come out as a surprise to all of uh, us and you know who those who actually appreciate a Grand Prix. But anyways, these were the major news uh, and development from sports from all over the globe. You guys can surely reach out to us on our social media handle, which is at the rate of Indus News Sports. And that is both for Twitter and Instagram. Till then, take good care of yourselves and bye-bye.